Thanks, Ralph, for joining us. Uh, pity that My because, pleasure. Of this, My pleasure. because of this all Corona, you can't be here in person, but uh, okay, uh, this new technology uh, full of failures as it is still, uh, still uh, makes us make it possible to be kind of in the same room, <laughs> kind of in the same room. Uh, you were in Zagreb, in fact, in 1990 in a jury. Uh, I don't right. know if you recall this. Sure. And uh, I love Zagreb. I think everybody knows your work. Uh, you changed the picture of animation. Lifetime achievement was uh, given to Norman McLaren, Chuck Jones, uh, John Hallas, uh, Dusan Vukotic, Jan Schmankmeyer, so Frederick Bach, and now this year you are the one who got it. Uh, congratulations, and uh, yes, the floor is yours. The virtual floor is yours. This is very exciting to me because basically I want to try to clear up a lot of things, um, and I want to try to tell a certain truth as to how I got to where I got. Now, all animation is done in one's time. The, what, the, the time that one lives in affects the animation. When animation started, it was way back, and it was on a learning curve where people were just trying to get better and better. Um, when I grew up in animation, when I got into the business in the 50s after high school, um, animation was collapsing. In other words, all the short studios that were making short animation brilliantly for the theaters were going out of business. Television was killing animation and all the studios were closing. So I started in the time um, when animation was collapsing. And um, I looked to European cartoons at that time for some sort of faith uh, in what was good or bad. Um, so I started in the time, but also America was changing at that time. Jazz was, jazz was becoming very popular. Uh, the, the underground was growing. The writing was changing. Movies had a rating system. The war in Vietnam was on. So what was happening around me, Bobby Dylan started to sing. So what was happening around me was a change in America um, where Disney which was the normal and which was the um, uh, God, the, the God wonderful thing that, that everyone wanted to do. Every animator wanted to work for Disney and every animator wanted to be Disney. Um, but I found nothing interesting in Disney other than when I was a young boy, I loved Pinocchio very much because the times were changing, but people continued and animation continued um, to want to do Disney. Or Disney was the way to go, and nothing else mattered. And their hold on the industry, you can't understand what a huge hold they had. Every critic, every person who wrote an article, every person wanted to be Disney, love Disney, eat Disney. And I'm not against Disney. I'm just, I just wanted to do my own animation. Now, I grew up in Terry Tunes, a great animation company, because it was the worst animation company, according to everybody. But it wasn't the worst animation company. I grew up in a company where animators were important. The old time animators, the old school animators are the best. I love the drawings on paper. I love the way they drew and the way they talked. I love the studio atmosphere. But they were terrible. According to Disney, they were the worst studio in the world. Now, Terry Tunes had one of the greatest animators in the world called Jim Tyre, T-Y-R-E. Obviously, I love anime. Um, Jim Tide did some of the most creative animation in the world. I was his assistant for a while. You should look it up on YouTube. You won't believe what you're looking at. Uh, everyone in the studio hated Jim Tire. And why did they hate Jim Tire? Because he was off character. He wasn't off character. He made some of the funniest drawings in the world. And Jim says character is not important. Humor is important. Everything moves. Just move it, Ralph. Don't worry about it. Just move it. So Jim taught me that just moving something was very important. And later on, when I had no money, but I still had to do my feature films, I realized that the story and just moving it or getting it done was important. In other words, um, Disney's hold on the industry was that you needed 25 or $30 million to do a film. Everything else was garbage. 
If you didn't do or spend that kind of money, you had nothing worthwhile to look at. Well, that's probably true if you're doing kids' films or if you're doing the same thing over and over again. You better make it very good to look at, but you don't have anything else there to interest anyone. Um, so my feeling was we had a million dollars. Disney said, Gig, you need 28 million. We didn't have any pencil pads. We didn't have any storyboards on Fritz and Heavy Traffic. All we had was me, when I learned the Terry tunes, because I was animated and I did all those jobs, and I wrote the script, was to keep the storyboards in my head and move things along. But what I learned in traffic, and what was part of what was happening out there, was I wasn't interested so much in what everyone was, what everyone was telling me about. Um, I was interested in creating something that emotionally would make would work without having to spend a lot of money because I didn't have any money. So to that, I, I used live action. I used photographs. And in the 50s and 60s, photography was a very big deal. Painting was a very big deal. Jazz was a very big deal. Music was a very, very big deal. Could you imagine I was the first guy to put rock and roll in an animated film? Maybelline and, and I mean these are the I used to, I bought hundreds of hours of music for ten bucks a piece because nobody wanted to use it in animation. Then I had a rating system to protect me. In other words, the, um, also the underground cartoons, cartoonists had started in America. All of this I'm feeding off of, but not Disney because everyone's feeding off of Disney. He, there was a studio, the Disney Studio itself was doing very bad films in the 60s and 70s. Um, this, there was a guy I ran into, first of all, there's a guy called Nick, Nicholas Liberoff. He's doing a documentary that I saw a piece of called Fantastic Mirror. It's about comics and animation in Europe at the same time I was animating Heavy Traffic. It's going to be a great film. Um, you guys should take a look at it. At any rate, so my my thing was to use what was around me. And I love the city. I love the darkness at night. I love the, the strange buildings. I love the shadows. I love the things that I was living in and living with. <coughs> All of this I brought to animation. Now, there was a thing in animation where you had to do one style in one picture. The entire picture had to be styled one way. And I didn't think that was true at all. I felt that if you use different styles and different scenes to emotionally put the scenes over, that was really more, that was better. <laughs> In other words, I was trying to do something that was more adult, more personal. I love studios. I love hanging around with animators. <clears throat> um, I love John Hubley. And he had his own studio and he did his own special film. So I was stuck somewhere between not wanting a big Disney studio, not wanting to hang around with animators, wanting to spend my day and time with them watching them draw. Uh, there's nothing better than watching those guys draw or hanging out with them uh, to this day. And the animators I had, right? You ready for this? All came from the short studios that were fired. The best animators from Warner Brothers and MGM and Disney Short came to my studio because they were fired. But they were the best. And why were they the best? All my early films were done without pencil tests. Understand that there wasn't any scene you looked at in Heavy Traffic or Fritz um, or American Pop or anything that had a pencil test behind it. I laid it out, or John Sperry laid it out, and we gave him the stuff, and I discussed it with him, and they animated it. That's how great these guys were. It went from the animation, no pencil test, uh, right to ink and paint. So this is the extraordinary extent that at my animators, who I love very dearly, and they're all gone. I didn't kill them. They just left. <laughs> they had enough. Um, did all my films without pencil test. Nevertheless, so what I was trying to do, I freed also producers. In my day, producers got all the credit. Doesn't matter who animated or directed whatever part of a picture. The producer picked up the uh, uh, the Oscar. The producer picked up this. I wanted the animator and the director to get the credit. So another thing I had done was I 
We had uh, producers on Frisky Cat and Heavy Traffic. You never heard of him. Because I finally turned the corner and made animators get what they deserve is what they do. Um, not, all of this was very important to me at the time. All of this was part of what I wanted to do. I grew up very poor, so I didn't feel very poor. Money wasn't the issue. Getting something animated that you really believed in was the issue. Now, I never thought I'd do more than Fritz the Cat. When they wanted me to do Fritz the Cat too, I said, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a sequel. I wanted to do Heavy Traffic. Heavy Traffic was a progression forward for me. It was more adult. It, was, it used different techniques. So I kept pushing the envelope, not worrying about merchandising. Though merchandising is great. I'm not putting any of that down. All I'm saying is I wanted animation to be the star and not anything else. Um, I love animation that much. Nevertheless, when I got to, when I got to LA with Fritz, uh, the, all the Disney animators took an ad out in, um, uh, took an ad out in uh, Variety, said I should go home with my garbage or my junk. And that started my fight with Disney. It's not enough that they're telling me uh, I need $28 million and, and they have nine old men that are better than my, <laughs> my nine old men, which their nine old men ain't. Them and the pencil mine don't. As Paul Terry told me, he said, Ralph, if I hire an animator, I don't want him to do a pencil test. I want him to know what he's doing. <laughs> so that was Terry Tunes. I said, okay, I got it. You know, when I worked at Terry Tunes, we didn't have pencil tests. So it wasn't unusual for me to say, okay, this is what I think. Now I animated for 10 years. I love animation. Um, but it wasn't going anywhere because I could do, control anything. The studios were controlled and all they wanted to do was Disney and all they wanted to do was television animation, Hanna-Barbera, which was the most disgusting stuff in the world. Um, it was, so animation was collapsing. That didn't stop the animators from thinking I was some sort of barbarian at the gate. Except for my animators, I had a very difficult time with the industry um, who didn't like me changing animation. They somehow they thought it was an attack on Disney or attack on their childhood. I kept explaining to everyone, I love childhood. My films are R-rated. I have a rating I'm working toward. You don't send your kids to see heavy traffic. I have a rating. The Monty Scorsese is able to do Mean Streets. Pollock is able, all these guys, these directors are able to do their films. Um, Anyhow, it was very, very difficult, but the times, now what is happening? So the times made me, Vietnam War, all these things were wow. Now, 45 years, 50 years later, after I made my films, these films I made for a million dollars or less are still playing. I can't tell you how many generations worldwide, I can't tell you how many generations of new young kids are finding my films at the right age, at the right time. I'm a little stunned by all this because during my time I was yelled at and it was, it was very, very difficult. I mean, I don't care today. I'm not trying to get even. It's just that there was no place to hide. There was no place to get any comfort except in my studio. That's why I love studios. Um, today, there is such incredible stuff done by computer. I don't really understand that there's things I've seen in animation today done by a computer that see on YouTube and stuff, that my mouth drops open. It's the impossibility of what I just saw. Um, yet no one talks about it. I mean, it's like it goes by everyone used to this sort of unbelievable machinery. Um, your animism during my time that I loved very much. Um, when I was growing up in my time, there's Paul Dresden, I thought was a sensational animator. Susan Pitt, I thought Susan Pitt, uh, did one of the greatest scenes in film history visually was the interior of the theater um, with all those puppets and everything moving around and the stuff coming off the screen. I have never seen a better image in film history than Susan Pitt's theater. Robert Cannon, Bo Cannon, who did uh, Moonbird and Jim Tyre. Uh, my animators, uh, Irv Spence, Manny Perez, Virgil Ross, all the great Warner Brothers and MGM animators, um, Saved my life time and time again without pencil tests. They did, by the way, they were also doing 30, 35 feet a week of full animation. 
um, which is an incredible rate. Disney was doing two or three a week. My guys were doing 30 a week. My films are still playing. So many of the films that were, and I'll tell you why I think they're playing. So many of the films that were made during my time are not playing. My films are playing because they're not about anything except what, what is going on. They're about what is happening as opposed to what some fantasy, I'm not opposed to fantasy. I love fantasy. But if you talk about what is happening, what you really care about, you might get some more juice in your films than having to make them look so beautiful and so pretty that what you're relying on is something gorgeous. I can't talk about computer animation. I can't talk about the studios today. Animation is doing very, very well financially as compared to my time when it was collapsing. So I don't know what to tell people except that because everything is so well organized and computerized, I, I think you should go back to old fashioned animation because the, the stuff today is so machine like. I mean, I look, at, I look at what's going on. If I was to do a film today, when I look at newsreels and everything, whether it's India or, or Australia or Europe, at, at major events or catastrophes, everybody's holding a phone in their hand. Everyone's got a phone. Of course, it's not a phone. They call it a phone. It's a computer. Everyone's holding a computer in their hand. People are becoming machines. It's the first step towards a dying planet, which is another big problem, um, and, a, and the re-emergence of fascism and stuff, which is another big problem. Um, but people are becoming machines is what, we, is what the companies are trying to do. Um, that's a great film. I'm not going to do it, but somebody over there, some animator out there should do a short or something. On, everyone's holding a computer in their hand. They're afraid to let go of it. They, they're afraid to be disconnected. They're afraid to think. Um, uh, I don't know what's going on. Animation is doing very, very well financially. If you want to get a job in animation in a computer company, I don't think animators are being treated with the same respect that they were in my time. In my time, animators were everything. They're still everything to me. Um, I don't know who's animating what today, um, but I don't see any animators taken over from the big names to, that are back, which is, you know, net, um, all the computer companies have their names up front, and these, and these are the companies that are taking the credit for doing all this wonderful work. Again, uh, I hear directors don't talk to animators anymore. They send little notes. I don't know what's going on. Um, so I will answer any questions now. Uh, I hope I didn't bore anybody. <laughs> Okay, but well, probably not because you are full of energy still, as we can see. <laughs> One of the questions is, I mean, you made uh, eight films in 11, eight features in 11 years. Uh, I, a lot of short filmmakers make uh, eight films in 25 years. So where did you find the energy? <laughs> so you were born this okay, way. Okay, I found it. Okay, that's a very good question. Look. Here's what I'm trying to say. And that's what Jim Tyre, my favorite, my, my wonderful mentor animator told me, is you can't get too... I am an artist. I draw every day of my life. I am still drawing. Okay? I draw and I paint every day. I got an animation that was all about drawing. Your animation is wonderful drawing. But if you get too precious with the drawing, if you get too worried about it having to be perfect, then what you're doing is you're missing the idea that's the most important. If you're afraid to change style or make something go out of character, you're doing a very big mistake to cartooning. Now, I am a cartoonist. I am not an illustrator. Animation was always about cartooning. Cartooning is about distortion, craziness. So if you worry too much and try to make it too good, and think that good is everything, well, it may be, but then it takes you all this time to finish. To me, what's important is to finish, get your idea done. Now, the animators today have this wonderful, the, the computer, let me tell you something, the computer technology today, I did a short film. I was stunned. The computer technology today on the mats, the pencil test, the coloring, 
All of this was done in a little box in my living room. The entire heavy traffic studio, which had a hundred people, was in a box on my studio. All I needed was an animator. Everything else was done. I said to myself, oh my God, if I was alive today, well, I am alive today. If I was working today, <laughs> if, if I was working today, I send my wife to work and I get a bunch of guys together and we'd make a film. I mean, it is. What cost me a million dollars to make was made for like $50,000. I mean, I could have made heavy traffic with that little box on the computer for $50,000. You should go make your own film. Why bother? And then try to sell it. You have so many venues to try to sell it in. You know, all these different people might want to buy it. I don't, so I would try that route if I was young, um, um, which is something I would definitely do because it's a, I would use technology to make my job easier, not to make unbelievable sequences and scenes that don't make any difference. You know, that's illustration. I mean, I love computer animation when it's right, but it's not cartooning, you see. And cartooning is what it's all about, you know. You were saying in another interview that honest drawing is, honest drawing is much better than a perfect drawing, something like this. That would be yes. a long line, yeah. Uh, when we were selecting or deciding what films to show, we asked you if you want to propose something and you proposed tra heavy traffic, which you mentioned already a couple of times. So why is this film particularly important to you? And I read somewhere that you started writing poems before when you were preparing or when you were starting to make a film, then you started with making a uh, drawing, not uh, drawing, writing poems. Uh, so why heavy okay. traffic is important to you? And so you are still- I got it. Poems. <laughs> okay, here we go. First of all, first the cat was funny animal, very important. Robert Crumb is great. Um, uh, it broke all the boundaries that, that was supposed to not happen in animation. It was perfect. And that was, and for me, it was a tremendous leap forward. You have to understand, having never looked at it before, I mean, the great thing about Disney films is every animation company looks at Disney and knows exactly what they have to do, and they try to copy Disney. I had no understanding of where to go. How far do you go on Fritz? What do you show? How much nudity? Okay, so after Fritz was over, it taught me a lot. And I learned about being on location in Fritz, that instead of doing fantasy backgrounds, I shot photographs of, the, of New York and had artists traced the photos on cell. So you had this beautiful line drawing of the background. And then my painter friend, Johnny Vita painted it. So I was on location. Every street in Frisky Cats, the real street, which was another major breakthrough. So when I got to heavy traffic, because I, I didn't want to do Fritz too, I, it broke all the barriers now because basically I wanted to use live action. I wanted to use different styles. I wanted to use adults, I mean, caricatures of real people instead of animals. And I wanted these people to have religions. They were Italians, they were Jewish, they were Irish. What I'm saying is the people in the cartoon were ethnic. For the first time you could, you know, that's a Jew, that's an Italian, that's a, that's a black man, you know? And this to me was very, very important. In other words, this never happened before became more real. So you had live action, you had uh, cartoons, you had rock and roll. Um, and what I would do is I, I love the writers it's in the city. I had, having never chased Disney, I keep saying that, but it's important to understand the whole industry was yelling at me. So I keep saying that. But anyhow, I love the poets. I love the writers. I love the photographers. I love the painters, Edward Hopper. Oh my God, he was great. I would write poems to find what I was feeling. It's the traffic that started with a poem. And Kuhn started with a poem. So I would write poems about how I felt about different things, how I felt about Vietnam and the war. Michael had a big sexual problem in heavy traffic. He was a boy who was 19 or 20 who never, who never went to bed with a girl. Could you imagine an animation character having that problem and talking about it? You see, uh, 
this is uh, why I love traffic so much. Because that was, to me, when I saw the film, I was stunned. I had no idea that I had done this, that, I, that this is what was happening. Um, as a matter of fact, during traffic, uh, the producer fired me. That he, he fired me because I was doing this stuff and he thought I was crazy. Uh, but the, the company, um, Steve Prince fired me. The company uh, who bought it, um, the motion picture company, AIP, said that they didn't hire the producer, they hired Ralph. So they put me back on. So, you know, this is a kind of crazy picture. I saw the picture without music. You want to talk about heavy? <laughs> music lightened up the picture. That was it. So that's why it's very important to me. It was, for me, the, it allowed me to do Lord of the Rings. It allowed me to do American Pop. It allowed me to change and go different places because I realized that Jim Tyre was right. Everything is possible. You know, things do not have to hook up. Uh, heavy traffic cost a million dollars. It's one of my, it was very important to me. And it was a very important story to me. Okay, good. Uh, I mean, uh, in this film, this New York street uh, atmosphere is so strong and, and uh, I would say, were you influenced by Fleischer Brothers? And uh, did they, was that your like, they, they had this urban, raunchy character to their cartoons. Well, look, let me, first of all, uh, uh, Fleischers are absolutely great. Fleischers, the Fleischer shorts are far better than anything ever done in the business. I am crazy about Fleischer. Um, but it wasn't Fleischer that influenced me. Uh, he could have, and I would say so. I love Fleischer. But it was the artists and the other things that influenced me. You know, I'm, and the movies, the photographer, and um, you see, animators keep using an animation to do their animation. What I am saying is you should look to other art forms to do your animation. I was more interested in writing, the beat poets, um, uh, the, the, the writers about the, the photographers and the painters and the movies. Serge Eisenstein, Eisenstein, the Russian director. I was crazy over the way he cut pictures. Um, La Strada. How much did La Strada teach me? If you want to talk about Fleischer, it's nothing compared to when I saw La Strada, I fell down. Okay. La Strada has more to do with traffic than Fleischer ever could. Okay. Fellini's La Strada was amazing. So I, <clears throat> I was interested in other art forms. Because the Disney art form or animators looking at animators bored the hell out of me. Because that's all they did is look at other animation to do their animation. And if somebody wants to do something else, they were barbarians at the gate. You know, I mean, the amount of fighting that I had to do with the animators who thought I was terrible. And I probably am terrible, but I made my film. In other words, all I was trying to do was make my film, leave me alone. I mean, you know, but they wouldn't leave me alone. Um, well, you succeeded so, in making your films, I would say. <laughs> that's right. It was at a cost. I'm laughing now, many years later. It look, I left the studio shaking at times, but it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Ivana. Like, any comments on the boom of adult animation in recent years? Like, while there is a positive trend of animations aimed at older audiences, a lot of those are re reboots, revivals, spin-offs of existing proprieties. That's the question. Did you? Well, it's the same old thing. In other words, uh, I wasn't doing adult animation. I was doing personal animation. The fact that personally I had to be put in a certain rating, okay. Uh, I wasn't looking at anything I wasn't looking at merchandising. I was looking at what I cared about, what I felt about world situation. Look at the wizard. Exactly what's happening today is what's in wizard. I wasn't looking at animation to the, so much of the adult animation thinks that if they curse, if they show some nudity, you know, if they if they show somebody vomiting, that's adult animation. That's not adult animation, that's disgusting animation. What I was interested in was ideas. What is happening in America? What is happening in Europe? 
What is happening to the planet? Those things that in, in had in the traffic, I said, garbage polluted the world. Well, garbage has polluted the world. So I'm saying those are the issues that make animation adult or personal. Not nudity, violence, disgust. In heavy metal and all these different people do this disgusting stuff. They say it's adult. Not adult. It's horrible to me. It's <laughs> yeah. about ideas. It's about ideas. The short anime is Paul Reisman, whatever his name is, right? It's a beautiful cartoon. It's about what he feels. He's talking for my generation. I don't want to mess around with today. He just, he's animated what he feels. He animates what he loves. He's the funniest animator I've ever seen next, next to Jim Taya. Um, yeah, he had a little guy get out of a, a knight's armor and sneak out of it. He was a guy who was inside the knight. He was the knight. He climbed out the back, this little guy. I nearly, giant knight in armor. He, little guy climbed out. I nearly fell off the chair. Anyhow, so that's what adult animation is. Um, um, yeah, okay. I lost my thought. I lost yeah, my that, thought. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There is another question that, uh, from Mattia. He would like to know how much of heavy traffic was autobiographical, uh, because as a young man, uh, he was under the impression there was autobiographical elements. So in the heavy traffic. The whole picture. The whole, the whole picture is autobiographical. So it's like your mother and father. Well, there's always and licenses you know, taken. Well, my mother and father didn't fight that way. My mother and father were very lovely and wonderful people. They, they ran, you know, during World War II, they kept running from country to country before we ended up in Brooklyn, starving but alive. Um, but there are people around me, people that lived in Brooklyn with me. Every part of traffic was somebody that, that I knew. So in that sense, it's all biographical. Michael had a lot of, most of the problems that I had. As a young cartoonist, I was afraid of women. Um, so what I'm saying is, so the entire picture had reality, and then the the, uh, the a lot of the people in my neighborhood disliked people of color, the mafia and everything. So Angie, I knew exactly what he was. So the entire picture was exactly for people I ran to, that I met, that I knew. The black cow was a friend of mine. So the whole was autobiographical because most of the stuff I used to do was autobiographical, even though I cover it up. Wizards was very autobiographical. Fritz had autobiographical scenes in it. So it's something an animator has to do if he wants to stay close to his film or make it personal, which is, you know, I'm somewhere between a big studio and a, and, and a full person one studio. I'm like right in the middle. I'm doing personal films in the studio. But I love studio. Um, so yeah, all, back, all and and you were mentioning. Uh, I mean, your background is uh, like a refugee background. So you were born in uh, Palestine, and how how much did that form you as a person or as, a, as an artist? You came to America, uh, escaping the Second World War, uh, being a refugee, which is. That's which a is, very good question. Which uh, is today a uh, very, very like uh, recent topic. Now, we have a lot of refugees everywhere and people think that the refugees come and steal your food from your table, you know, and uh, you were one of those and now you're the one of the, one of the best animators or uh, most important animators in the scene in the history of animation. So how much did that influence you? Well, look, background. that's a good question. That's a good question. Listen, my family ran from Russia with some money to, to Palestine, um, which was a British. My passport says I'm a, I'm a British subject. I was born in Palestine, but then they started shooting at everybody in Palestine. So my family finally picked up and went to America. Okay, now, uh, you can't grow up in Brooklyn in America during the war without seeing your parents who got letters every day from Europe about another one of their relatives getting killed and dead. My mother's entire family was murdered in Russia. Um, 
you can't grow up without understanding the world is not a great place necessarily. You can't, a lot of that had tremendous effect on why I can talk this way about Disney and other studios about not talking about what is going on. In other words, can't grow up and dismiss the horror that war brings to people. You can't, uh, that was part of my growing up. That was part of what made me who I was. You know, I understood the pain and the anguish um, that can go on. That made it very hard for me to say, uh, when you wish upon a star. You know, it, it made no sense to me as a young man. And it made no sense to me that that's the kind of film everyone wants to keep doing and think that they're doing something great and that I'm doing something sick. Um, so just growing up with an immigrant family, starving, uh, also not having money never bothered me. A lot of the things that I was able to do in animation was that I don't mind being poor. I think what's most important is getting your ideas out. In other words, it'd be nice to have a sports car, but not as nice as doing heavy traffic. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you can't go. You, so my life could not be what it was in animation if it wasn't for uh, my parents. Like, you see these books behind me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, there's a whole room here for thousands of books. Right? So the biggest thing, I'm doing, I'm doing contracts with my lawyer to my various pictures. And in every movie contract with the movie company, there's, there's a, a little line that says money for research. Research. Yeah. Money for research yeah. meant to me that I go to the art store, $2,000 in there, $4,500. I go to the art store and every picture, bookstore and every picture, and buy every book I can find. And they're still here. So I <laughs> worried more about not how much I was making, how much they gave me for research. Research is so behind me. <laughs> and you read all of them. <laughs> you, you read yeah. all of them. <laughs> they're all about artists. They're all different yeah. painters and photographers. They're all art. They're not, they're not books I'm reading. I, I, uh, they're art books. Every one of those. And it goes, you know, <laughs> I love art. Drawing is everything. Without drawing, there's nothing. That's that's uh, how I think everybody here feels in the animated world, and everybody is not so much uh, after a Lamborghini, but more like uh, characters moving <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> that's why I'm so. That's why I'm so happy I'm here. I'm so happy I finally got asked to be here. All the people that came before me, I know everyone lit, um, and I love talking animes and telling the truth. I'm trying to make them understand that we did our film without pet. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about my crew. Yeah, yeah. We did our films without pencil tests, without storyboards, without you know all the stuff that other feature film studios spent money on needlessly, color correction, the night is a day. You know, uh, uh, I kept all of that in my head because why? I worked at Terry Tunes, and at Terry Tunes, nobody cared. You did everything yourself, and it taught me a lot. And Jim Tyus said, everything moves, just keep going. And he was right. Okay, there is another question from uh, in the chat, like in Jackson's Lord of the Rings, there are obvious nods to your adaptation with even certain shots being redone. Was there any communication between you and Jackson before and after his movie was done? Jackson, Jackson never spoke to me once. Jackson okay. never bought me a bottle of wine. Jackson <laughs> saw my films in the movies, uh, Lord of the Rings, and you know, Jackson took whatever he wanted to do and left. Now, when I was doing Ring, and again, um, you know, the big problem with ha Tolkien's fans, who I love very much, and how do I make sure that I don't run over them or disappoint them? All right, so the clothes, how the hobbits look, how the race look, how the Shire looked, all these things we at Bakshi Productions designed and set the standards for. There wasn't anything before. So what I'm saying is we set this, so I didn't have a film to look at like Peter Jackson had. So uh, I, have not, I, have not, I have nothing to say. I, have not, I haven't seen his rings. Um, but no, there was absolutely no contact to date, which is why I so freely asked him to send me a bottle of wine. 
Okay. When we meet him, we will tell him. <laughs> But... I don't want to meet him. I don't want to meet him. I want the bottle of wine. <laughs> yes. But uh, I, don't I, don't, I don't want to meet him at all. Okay. I'll punch him in the face. <laughs> Well, to, to my opinion, uh, in, your, in your film, in, in your adaptation, there were better directed scenes than in his, but that's only my opinion. <laughs> the, the one when they are killing... Oh, what are you? Uh, you can't. You can't. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, I like but... you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh... You're okay. You're okay. I guess, I guess uh, the question which you get asked every time, Uh, is uh, the Robert Crumb thing because they he was in his documentary he was saying that he was against the uh, Fritz the Cat adaptation and I was also watching some interview with you maybe you want to tell to people how you felt about it uh... well it's a sad story first of all uh, I think Crumb is great um, Crumb there was a producer called Steve Kratz I thought it'd be a great book to do and then As a film director, especially in animation, it wasn't surprising to pick a, a property in my day. So instead of picking uh, Peter Pan, I picked Robert Crumb's Underground because I was very much in love with the Underground. There was another artist called Spain Rodriguez, who I would have gone with also, who I loved his trash man very much. Um, so I went out to California to talk to Crumb because my producer wanted to buy the rights. Crumb and his wife and his family and his lawyer sold the rights to Fristy Cat to the producer. Okay, he received $50,000, that was in 1968, 69, and the producer hired me to direct. I asked Crumb if he could come aboard and help me finish the picture. I would love to have the money. Uh, he said no, and he disappeared. Okay. Crumb has made millions of dollars for Fritzy Cat. Crumb has made millions of dollars for Fritzy Cat. And yet he still complains about what I did. He still makes believe that he is the underground artist that never sold out. Crumb lives in France in a house drinking wine all the time. I'm still here with my books going through them. Uh, I don't know what Crumb's problem was except that what he misunderstood and what he didn't get because Crumb is a great hustler is that in my business, the film business, the man that makes the film, the director and writer, it's the guy that gets the credit. I mean, that's the animation, that's the film business. Everyone's doing properties, other properties. Now, if he doesn't like the picture, I don't care. I liked it. I wasn't making the picture for him. I want him to like it. But I was making the picture for me and for animation. In other words, the animation industry needed to go adult. So I had bigger fish to fry than whether Robert Crumb liked the picture or not. I did the best I could with the money I had. He made a lot of money. Now, when he made a film recently about his life, uh, he took his camera into his house and photographed his whole family who wasn't doing very well at the time. I would never have done that. So I don't know what's with Crumb. I think he's a great artist. Uh, I think he misunderstood Um, I think he got mad at that. Everyone says Fritz is so great. I think he got mad at me on a personal level. It was his character, and I became what I was. And I don't want to do Fritz too. He can have it back. Now, he doesn't talk about Fritz too. He only talks about Fritz one. Have you ever seen The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat? It is the second Fritz the Cat that was done by another director, same producer. It is the worst piece of garbage in the world. It is the worst film I've ever seen. He doesn't say a word about that. So he only talks about me. Yet I'm the guy that made him millions of dollars. Uh, go figure it, you know, but it's no different today in this world. You, you know, do you understand what's going on today? I don't, you know, so he's no different. No one has any integrity. Him and which is, he didn't send me a bottle of wine either. He neither. <laughs> he didn't send me wine. Okay. We will send, he, never we will. Me, he never sent me a reefer. What? We will send you a bottle of wine from Zagreb. Uh, no, 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 I want Jackson too. Jackson, okay, okay. Uh, there are two more in the chat questions. 
uh, like your Lord of the Rings was financial success, why did the studio stop the sequel? I did. I had a very look. It was very difficult to do talks. I had to go to England and get the okay from his daughter because I wanted her to be happy. I was going to do three pictures. Part one, part two, part three. Just like the book. Just like they ended up doing. So the first picture I finished was part one. In my contract, it says it has to be advertised as part one. It did not advertise it as part one. They reneged because they didn't think anybody would show up to see one part. So the, everyone came to the theater thinking the picture was going to be all in finished. When the picture ended in the, what they thought was no end, which was part one for me, they started to boo. Uh, I was very let down. I was very disgusted. And I wouldn't do part two and three when they asked me years later because I didn't want to buy. I don't want to deal with the people that did, that did so much harm to me. I did the picture in a year and a, a couple of weeks. It was so difficult. Um, I worked so hard. And the simple, and would have been a much bigger hit in America. Um, had they just done what they said they were going to do. So that's why I didn't do part two. I also had other film things to do. Um, uh, uh, it was a, most of my experiences with the studios and producers have been very bad. Not that I'm so bad, but you know, I, I, integrity is not part of what they do. And I keep looking for integrity. Yeah. Which is my mistake. Yeah. That's my mistake. I, I'm a fool for looking for integrity. You know what I mean? Yeah, but on the oh, other hand, people, what? You know, on the other hand, if you wouldn't do that, then you wouldn't be here where you are. So, if you sell yourself, if you don't, if you are don't. Well, I can't. I'd like to sell myself. I don't know. How to, <laughs> okay. I don't know how to do it, man. I could <laughs> all those women and cars and sports cars. I could have. I could have done commercial Disney. I could have, I could have had television shows. I could have done, I could have done heavy traffic for TV and blah blah blah. No, no, you couldn't, <laughs> and that's the good part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the the other question from the chat from Nicholas. Uh, you are a gr great storyteller. He was always impressed by the human dimensions of your characters. He had never seen a film like American Pop, for example. Uh, we find the same authenticity in your paintings. Like, how do you work on the soul of your characters, whether in a film or in a painting? So how do you put the soul in your characters? Uh, Does this question make sense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Oh, it's a good, it's, a, it's the right question. Uh, I put my soul, I work through a stream of consciousness, whether it's a poem or a script. I wrote Heavy Traffic in one day. I wrote Wizards in one day. What I do is I start and I don't edit. Now, who taught me that was Jack Kerouac. Not that I like On the Road, but what he did is a stream of consciousness interested me. And then the abstract painters, what they did, like Jackson Pollock, and his stream painting always interested me. Um, and jazz improvisation interests me. How, you know, Charlie Parker would take a tune and make it his own. So when I sit down to do a painting or a drawing, I have nothing in mind. I don't sit down with any roughs or anything or a character. I have nothing in mind. I sit down and I just start. And it's very interesting to see what arrives. In other words, uh, Picasso said, and I agree with the guy, <laughs> he, and not that I'm him, uh, he said he doesn't, uh, he finds, he doesn't, he doesn't try to learn something, he finds something. In other words, I find things as they go along. And all my character painting, right, uh, I repaint them 50, 60, 70 times before they, at the end, they look like I painted them once, but I really keep changing and shifting. That's the joy uh, of doing art for me now. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing where Jim Tyre would do an animated scene or Paul Reisner 
and the, the squash and the stretch and all the bubbling stuff. Uh, he's looking for an emotion. That's why his stuff works. The guys that are pre-planned, uh, if you know where you're going, you get bored. I mean, if you, you're doing roughs and all the stuff to get a painting done is boring. Um, and the same thing with a film. In other words, you have to let your um, inside emotions dictate or deep psychological emotions dictate where you're going, but you don't necessarily know where you're going. Now, throw away a lot of paintings? Oh, sure. But, you know, in destroying them because you just pushed them too far, that's a lot of fun also. So uh, I don't have anything in mind. I just sit down. My characters, I just sit down and start. And it's always wonderful when I finish one to see where I came from and where it went. To me, it's like a journey. Um, the same thing in heavy traffic in my films. You know, you start with live action, you go to this, you go to that. Collage. I love collage, you know. Um, so that's, that's how I work to this day. Because, again, that's 50s. That's Jackson Pollock. That's the beat. We talked earlier about what I grew up with, what I was into. That's all that I learned as a young man um, by not going to the movies and seeing Cinderella. <laughs> I went to Greenwich Village and I saw the underground movie. So uh, all these things were the kinds of things that were happening in my time in, in the art forms in America that I was into. I wasn't looking at animation again for inspiration. I was looking to other art forms to teach me how to animate. You see, I wasn't looking at animation to teach me how to animate. I was looking at other art forms to teach me how to animate. That's very important to me. And I think that might be important to people out there. You can't look at animation too much because all you end up is psychologically copying it deep down inside. Look at something else and try to animate. Uh, when we were preparing this, you were also mentioning that, uh, or I saw in an interview that you disliked uh, the UPA style. While talking now, you mentioned a couple of UPA uh, people who you liked. So, uh, and also Zagreb School of Animation had some influence uh, visually by UPA. So, uh, what what was your problem with UPA? <laughs> I didn't have a problem with UPA. Uh, I didn't have a problem with the artwork. I had a problem with what they did. In other words, it's the same thing. In other words, it's animation. Look, you know, I, how do I say this? Bo Cannon, who did Hubley's Moonbirds, is brilliant. The story's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. It's still brilliant. It's just it's just Bo Cannon did the animation of the scene on something like that. It's perfect. If you put that in the UPA school, fine. But if you do some of these films, UPA got to remember animation is falling apart in America. We have to understand my time. So UPA gets a big show to put on television. First show in animation on Sunday at night. It was a great opportunity for UPA to do something in the area that I eventually tried to think about, something else. So they have great design. And so many of their pictures are boring. I mean, great design, great artwork, great backgrounds, great camera work. It's a boring picture. In other words, they're not talking about anything. They're talking about on a windy day. The stuff, so, so many of the films were just pretentious. You got to be very careful. Don't forget, I'm a guy that wants to talk about something. UPA, brilliant artwork, but much about nothing. And then, you know, uh, the, and, then for, and then first, then how many, I mean, the, how many times do I have to see that blind guy, Mr. Magoo, before you get bored out of your head? Great design. How many times do I have to hear boing, boing, go boing, boing, before I say, well, come on, man, something else. Yeah, yeah. And consequently, yeah. UPA disappeared for that reason. They weren't about anything except design. Now, Paul Reisner, a lot of the guys, Eva, uh, Susan Pitt, they're about something else. Yeah. They're not about just yeah. the, the, the great design and everything. But Susan Pitt, emotionally amazing as Farragut. I mean, stunning piece of artwork. So 
I don't particularly dislike UPA, but they had a great opportunity, which again, looking at, they looked at animation, pretentious, and none of their films were boring. Once in a while, they do a good film. Uh, but the UPA didn't do Hubley's film. Hubley Studio did his own film. There is a... Yeah, there is a, we will slowly come to the end to let you live your life <laughs> further with, with, uh, I don't know. You can't yell life. anymore? <laughs> what? I can't yell anymore? I'm finished? You can, I'm you know, finished. if you want, uh, you said you can talk for two weeks, so uh, we can stay here for a while. <laughs> but there is, there is another question from, uh, from uh, Chet uh, about Spider-Man. Uh, how did you get the job? Uh, did you research any of the comic books before? And uh, the person, Lovro, says that he finds your episodes to be much more interesting than the ones you didn't work on. And how uh, did you deal with the budget constraints of TV animation? So the, what kind of constraints? Uh, budget, so low budget. budget. Like Low well, budget is my middle name. I mean, but it's your middle name. If she gave me a lot of money, I would change. If she gave me a lot of money, I'd pass out um, uh, and probably blow it. Uh, uh, I was building a studio. I had just come out of Canada. I was working for Al Guest on Rocket Robin Hood with uh, European animators. It was a wonderful place, wonderful studio for Steve Krantz, the guy that we did Trist the Cat with. And he and and he and the uh, studio got into a fight, um, uh, a lawsuit or something. So I had to come back to New York and continue the series. Um, he asked if I could finish it. And then he got into another fight with, with the guys that were doing Spider-Man in LA. He asked if I could finish that. So I wanted my own studio. And that was a great opportunity. That, and there was no other work around. Uh, that was a great opportunity at that time for me to start the building blocks, and it worked. Um, and, but what I did was I went out and I hired uh, comic book artists. Instead of animators, I went out and I hired the best comic book artists in the world. Wally Wood, Steranko, uh, all the guys to do layouts, not animators. I used comic book artists to do comic book storyboards, which then I handed to the animators in the studio. Um, as far as the budget goes, it wasn't my concern. Um, uh, never had any money, so I just told them the best they could. Uh, I wasn't too excited or cared very much for Spider-Man. I just wanted to start my studio, and it worked. I went from that to first to cat. So that plan worked out. I'm pretty good when it comes to how do you keep moving along? How do you keep hustling? Uh, that's Brooklyn. <laughs>